9. The Thing in the Forest I strode through the undergrowth that clothed the ridge behind the house, scarcely heeding whither I went, passed on through the shadow of a thick cluster of straight-stemmed trees beyond it, and so presently found myself some way on the other side of the ridge, and descending towards a streamlet that ran through a narrow valley. I paused and listened. The distance I had come, or the intervening masses of thicket, deadened any sound that might be coming from the enclosure. The air was still. Then, with a rustle, a rabbit emerged and went scampering up the slope before me. I hesitated and sat down in the edge of the shade. The place was a pleasant one. The rivulet was hidden by the luxuriant vegetation on the banks, save at one point where I caught a triangular patch of its glittering water. On the farther side I saw through a bluish haze a tangle of trees and creepers, and above these again the luminous blue of the sky. Here and there a splash of white or crimson marked the blooming of some trailing epiphyte. I let my eyes wander over this scene for a while, and then began to turn over in my mind again the strange peculiarities of Montgomery's man. But it was too hot to think elaborately, and presently I fell into a tranquil state midway between dozing and waking. From this I was aroused, after I know not how long, by a rustling amidst the greenery on the other side of the stream. For a moment I could see nothing but the waving summits of the ferns and reeds. Then suddenly upon the bank of the stream appeared something. At first I could not distinguish what it was. It bowed its round head to the water and began to drink. Then I saw it was a man, going on all fours like a beast. He was clothed in bluish cloth and was of a copper-coloured hue with black hair. It seemed that grotesque ugliness was an invariable character of these islanders. I could hear the suck of the water at his lips as he drank. I leant forward to see him better, and a piece of lava, detached by my hand, went pattering down the slope. He looked up guiltily, and his eyes met mine. Forthwith he scrambled to his feet and stood wiping his clumsy hand across his mouth and regarding me. His legs were scarcely half the length of his body. So, staring one another out of countenance, we remained for perhaps the space of a minute. Then, stopping to look back once or twice, he slunk off amongst the bushes to the right of me, and I heard the swish of the fronds go faint in the distance and die away. Long after he had disappeared, I remained sitting up, staring in the direction of his retreat. My drowsy tranquillity had gone. I was startled by a noise behind me, and turning suddenly saw the flapping white tail of a rabbit vanishing up the slope. I jumped to my feet. The apparition of this grotesque half-bestial creature had suddenly populated the stillness of the afternoon for me. I looked around me rather nervously, and regretted that I was unarmed. Then I thought that the man I had just seen had been clothed in bluish cloth, had not been naked as a savage would have been, and I tried to persuade myself from that fact that he was, after all, probably a peaceful character, that the dull ferocity of his countenance belied him. Yet I was greatly disturbed at the apparition. I walked to the left along the slope, turning my head about and peering this way and that amongst the straight stems of the trees. Why should a man go on all fours and drink with his lips? Presently I heard an animal wailing again, and taking it to be the puma, I turned about and walked in a direction diametrically opposed to the sound. This led me down to the stream across which I stepped and pushed my way up through the undergrowth beyond. I was startled by a great patch of vivid scarlet on the ground, and going up to it found it to be a particular fungus, branched and corrugated like a foliaceous lichen, but deliquescing into slime at the touch. And then, in the shadow of some luxuriant ferns, I came upon an unpleasant thing, the dead body of a rabbit, covered with shining flies, but still warm, and with the head torn off. I stopped aghast at the sight of the scattered blood. Here, at least, was one visitor to the island disposed of. There were no traces of other violence about it. It looked as though it had been suddenly snatched up and killed, and as I stared at the little furry body came the difficulty of how the thing had been done. 
The vague dread that had been in my mind since I had seen the inhuman face of the man at the stream grew distincter as I stood there. I began to realize the hardihood of my expedition amongst these unknown people. The thicket about me became altered to my imagination. Every shadow became something more than a shadow, became an ambush. Every rustle became a threat. Invisible things seemed watching me. I resolved to go back to the enclosure on the beach. I suddenly turned away and thrust myself violently, possibly even frantically, through the bushes, anxious to get a clear space around me again. I stopped just in time to prevent myself emerging upon an open space. It was a kind of glade in the forest made by a fall. Seedlings were already starting up to struggle for the vacant space. And beyond, the dense growth of stems and twining vines and splashes of fungus and flowers closed in again. Before me, squatting together upon the fungoid ruins of a huge fallen tree and still unaware of my approach, were three grotesque human figures. One was evidently a female, the other two were men. They were naked, save for swathings of scarlet cloth around their middle, and their skins were of a dull, pinkish, drab cover, such as I had seen in no savages before. They had fat, heavy, chinless faces, retreating foreheads, and a scant, bristly hair upon their heads. I never saw such bestial-looking creatures. They were talking, or at least one of the men was talking to the other two, and all three had been too closely interested to heed the rustling of my approach. They swayed their heads and shoulders from side to side. The speaker's words came thick and sloppy, though I could hear them distinctly, I could not distinguish what he said. He seemed to me to be reciting some complicated gibberish. Presently, his articulation became shriller, and spreading his hands, he rose to his feet. At that, the others began to gibber in unison, also rising to their feet, spreading their hands and swaying their bodies in rhythm with the chant. I noticed then the abnormal shortness of their legs and their lank, clumsy feet. All three began slowly to circle round, raising and stamping their feet and waving their arms. A kind of tune crept into their rhythmic recitation and a refrain, Alula or Balula, it sounded like. Their eyes began to sparkle and their ugly faces to brighten with an expression of strange pleasure. Saliva dripped from their lipless mouths. Suddenly, as I watched their grotesque and unaccountable gestures, I perceived clearly for the first time what it was that had offended me, what had given me the two inconsistent and conflicting impressions of utter strangeness, and yet of the strangest familiarity. The three creatures engaged in this mysterious rite were human in shape, and yet human beings with the strangest air about them of some familiar animal. Each of these creatures, despite its human form, its rag of clothing, and the rough humanity of its body form, had woven into it, into, into its movements, into the expression of its countenance, into its whole presence, some now irresistible suggestion of a hog, a swinish taint, the unmistakable mark of the beast. I stood overcome by this amazing realization, and then the most horrible questions came rushing into my mind. They began leaping in the air, first one and then the other, whooping and grunting. Then one slipped and for a moment was on all fours, to recover indeed forthwith. But that transitory gleam of the true animalism of these monsters was enough. I turned as noiselessly as possible, and, becoming every now and again rigid with fear of being discovered as a branch cracked or a leaf rustled, I pushed back into the bushes. It was long before i grew bolder and dared to move freely my only idea for the moment was to get away from these foul beings and i scarcely noticed that i had emerged upon a faint pathway amidst the trees then suddenly transversing a little glade i saw with an unpleasant start two clumsy legs among the trees walking with noiseless footsteps parallel with my course and perhaps thirty yards away from me the head and upper part of the body was hidden by a tangle of creeper. I stopped abruptly, hoping the creature did not see me. The feet stopped as I did. 
So nervous was I that I controlled an impulse to headlong flight with the utmost difficulty. Then, looking hard, I distinguished through the interlacing network the head and body of the brute I had seen drinking. He moved his head. There was an emerald flash in his eyes as he glanced at me from the shadows of the trees, a half-luminous color that vanished as he turned his head again. He was motionless for a moment, and then, with a noiseless tread, began running through the green confusion. In another moment he had vanished behind some bushes. I could not see him, but I felt that he had stopped and was watching me again. What on earth was he, man or beast? What did he want with me? I had no weapon, not even a stick. Flight would be madness. At any rate, the thing, whatever it was, lacked the courage to attack me. Setting my teeth hard, I walked straight towards him. I was anxious not to show the fear that seemed chilling my backbone. I pushed through a tangle of tall, white flower and bushes, and saw him twenty paces beyond, looking over his shoulder at me and hesitating. I advanced a step or two, looking steadfastly into his eyes. "'Who are you?' said I. He tried to meet my gaze. "'No!' he said suddenly, and turning, went bounding away from me through the undergrowth. Then he turned and stared at me again. His eyes shone brightly out of the dusk under the trees. My heart was in my mouth, but I felt my only chance was bluff and walked steadily towards him. He turned again and vanished into the dusk. Once more, I thought I caught the glint of his eyes and that was all. For the first time, I realized how the lateness of the hour might affect me. The sun had set some minutes hence, the swift dusk of the tropics was already fading out of the eastern sky, and a pioneer moth fluttered silently by my head. Unless I would spend the night amongst the unknown dangers of the mysterious forest, I must hasten back to the enclosure. The thought of a return to that pain-haunted refuge was extremely disagreeable, but still more so was the idea of being overtaken in the open by darkness and all that darkness might conceal. I gave one more look into the blue shadows that had swallowed up this odd creature and then retraced my way down the slope towards the stream, going, as I judged, in the direction from which I had come. I walked eagerly, my mind confused with many things, and presently found myself in a level place amongst scattered trees. The colourless clearness that comes after the sunset flush was darkling. The blue sky above grew momentarily deeper, and the little stars, one by one, pierced the attenuated light. The interspaces of the trees, the gaps in the further vegetation that had been hazy blue in the daylight, grew black and mysterious. I pushed on. The colour vanished from the world. The treetops rose against the luminous blue sky in inky silhouette, and all below that outline melted into one formless blackness. Presently, the trees grew thinner, and the shrubby undergrowth more abundant. Then there was a desolate space covered with a white sand, and then another expanse of tangled bushes. I did not remember crossing the sand opening before. I began to be tormented by a faint rustling upon my right hand. I thought at first it was fancy, for whenever I stopped there was silence, save for the evening breeze in the treetops. Then when I turned to hurry on again, there was an echo to my footsteps. I turned away from the thickets, keeping to the more open ground, and endeavouring by sudden turns now and then to surprise something in the act of creeping upon me. I saw nothing and nevertheless my sense of another presence grew steadily. I increased my pace, and after some time came to a slight ridge, crossed it, and turned sharply, regarding it steadfastly from the further side. It came out black and clear-cut against the darkling sky, and presently a shapeless lump heaved up momentarily against the skyline and vanished again. I felt assured now that my tawny-faced antagonist was stalking me once more, and coupled with that was another unpleasant realization that I had lost my way. For a time I hurried on, hopelessly perplexed, and pursued by that stealthy approach. Whatever it was, the thing either lacked the courage to attack me, or it was waiting to take me at some disadvantage. 
I kept studiously to the open. At times I would turn and listen, and presently I had half persuaded myself that my pursuer had abandoned the chase, or was a mere creation of my disordered imagination. Then I heard the sound of the sea. I quickened my footsteps almost into a run, and immediately there was a stumble in my rear. I turned suddenly and stared at the uncertain trees behind me. One black shadow seemed to leap into another. I listened rigid and heard nothing but the creep of the blood in my ears. I thought that my nerves were unstrung and that my imagination was tricking me and turned resolutely towards the sound of the sea again. In a minute or so the trees grew thinner and I emerged upon a bare low headland running out into the sombre water. The night was calm and clear and the reflection of the growing multitude of the stars shivered in the tranquil heaving of the sea. Some way out, the wash upon an irregular band of reef shone with a pallid light of its own. Westward, I saw the zodiacal light mingling with the yellow brilliance of the evening star. The coast fell away from me to the east, and westward it was hidden by the shoulder of the cape. Then I recalled the fact that Moreau's beach lay to the west. A twig snapped behind me, and there was a rustle. I turned and stood facing the dark trees. I could see nothing, or else I could see too much. Every dark form in the dimness had its ominous quality, its peculiar suggestion of alert watchfulness. So I stood for perhaps a minute, and then with an eye to the trees still, turned westward to cross the headland. And as I moved, one among the lurking shadows moved to follow me. My heart beat quickly. Presently, the broad sweep of a bay to the westward became visible, and I halted again. The noiseless shadow halted a dozen yards from me. A little point of light shone on the further bend of the curve, and the grey sweep of the sandy beach lay faint under the starlight. Perhaps two miles away was that little point of light. To get to the beach, I should have to go through the trees where the shadows lurked, and down a bushy slope. I could see the thing rather more distinctly now. It was no animal, for it stood erect. At that, I opened my mouth to speak and found a hoarse phlegm choked my voice. I tried again <coughs> and shouted, Who's there? There was no answer. I advanced a step. The thing did not move, only gathered itself together. My foot struck a stone. That gave me an idea. Without taking my eyes off the black form before me, I stooped and picked up this lump of rock. But at my motion, the thing turned abruptly as a dog might have done, and slunk obliquely into the further darkness. Then I recalled a schoolboy expedient against big dogs, and twisted the rock into my handkerchief, and gave this a turn round my wrist. I heard a movement further off among the shadows, as if the thing was in retreat. Then suddenly my tense excitement gave way. I broke into a profuse perspiration and fell a-trembling, with my adversary routed and this weapon in my hand. It was some time before I could summon resolution to go down through the trees and bushes upon the flank of the headland to the beach. At last I did it as a run, and as I emerged from the thicket upon the sand, I heard some other body come crushing after me. At that I completely lost my head with fear, and began running along the sand. Forthwith there came the swift patter of soft feet in pursuit. I gave a wild cry and redoubled my pace. Some dim black things about three or four times the size of rabbits went running or hopping up from the beach towards the bushes as I passed. So long as I live, I shall remember the terror of that chase. I ran near the water's edge, and heard every now and then the splash of the feet that gamed upon me. Far away, hopelessly far, was the yellow light. All the night about us was black and still. Splash, splash, came the pursuing feet nearer and nearer. I felt my breath going, for I was quite out of training. It whooped as I drew it, and I felt a pain like a knife in my side. I perceived the thing would come up with me long before I reached the enclosure, and, desperate and sobbing for my breath, I wheeled around upon it and struck as it came upon me, struck with all my strength. The stone came out of the sling of the handkerchief as I did so. As I turned, the thing, which had been running on all fours, rose to its feet, and the missile fell fair on its left temple. 
The skull rang loud, and the animal man blundered into me, thrust me back with his hands, and went staggering past me to fall headlong upon the sand with its face in the water, and there it lay still. I could not bring myself to approach that black heap. I left it there, with the water rippling round it under the still stars, and giving it a wide berth, pursued my way towards the yellow glow of the house, and presently, with a positive effect of relief, came the pitiful moaning of the puma, the sound that had originally driven me out to explore this mysterious island. At that, though I was faint and horribly fatigued, I gathered together all my strength, and began running again towards the light. I thought I heard a voice calling me. 10. The Crying of the Man As I drew near the house, I saw that the light shone from the open door of my room, and then I heard, coming from out of the darkness at the side of that orange oblong of light, the voice of Montgomery shouting, Prendick! I continued running. Presently I heard him again. I replied by a feeble, Hello! and in another moment had staggered up to him. "'Where have you been?' said he, holding me at arm's length, so that the light from the door fell upon my face. "'We've both been so busy that we'd forgot you until about half an hour ago.' He led me into the room and sat me down on the deck chair. For a while I was blinded by the light. "'We did not think you would start to explore this island of ours without telling us,' he said. And then, "'I was afraid, but what? Oh, hello!' My last remaining strength slipped from me, and my head fell forward on my chest. I think he found a certain satisfaction in giving me brandy. "'For God's sake,' said I, "'fasten that door.' "'You've been meeting some of our curiosities, eh?' said he. He locked the door and turned to me again. He asked me no questions, but gave me some brandy and water and pressed me to eat. I was in a state of collapse. He said something vague about his forgetting to warn me, and asked me briefly when I left the house and what I had seen. I answered him as briefly, in fragmentary sentences. "'Tell me what it all means,' said I, in a state bordering on hysterics. "'It's nothing so very dreadful,' said he, "'but I think you have had enough for one day.' The puma suddenly gave a sharp yell of pain. At that he swore under his breath. "'I'm damned,' said he. "'if this place is not as bad as Gower Street with its cats.' "'Montgomery,' said I, "'what was that thing that came after me? "'Was it a beast or was it a man?' "'If you don't sleep tonight,' he said, "'you'll be off your head tomorrow.' "'I stood up in front of him. "'What was that thing that came after me?' I asked. "'He looked me squarely in the eyes "'and twisted his mouth askew. His eyes, which had seemed animated a minute before, went dull. "'From your account,' said he, "'I'm thinking it was a bogle.' I felt a gust of intense irritation, which passed as quickly as it came. I flung myself into the chair again and pressed my hands on my forehead. The puma began once more. Montgomery came round behind me and put his hand on my shoulder. "'Look here, Prendick,' he said. I have no business to let you drift out into this silly island of ours, but it's not so bad as you feel, man. Your nerves are worked to rags. Let me give you something that will make you sleep. That will keep on for hours, yet you must simply get to sleep, or I won't answer for it. I did not reply. I bowed forward and covered my face with my hands. Presently he returned with a small measure containing a dark liquid. This he gave me. I took it unresistingly, and he helped me into the hammock. When I awoke, it was broad day. For a little while I lay flat, staring at the roof above me. The rafters, I observed, were made out of the timbers of a ship. Then I turned my head and saw a huge meal prepared for me on the table. I perceived that I was hungry, and prepared to clamber out of the hammock, which, very politely anticipating my intention, twisted round and deposited me upon all fours on the floor. I got up and sat down before the food. I had a heavy feeling in my head, and only the vaguest memory at first of the things that had happened overnight. The morning breeze blew very pleasantly through the unglazed window, and that and the food contributed to the sense of animal comfort which I experienced. Presently, the door behind me, the door inward towards the yard of the enclosure, opened. I turned and saw Montgomery's face. All right, 
said he. I'm frightfully busy. And he shut the door. Afterwards, I discovered that he forgot to relock it. Then I recalled the expression of his face the previous night, and with that the memory of all I had experienced reconstructed itself before me. Even as that fear came back to me, came a cry from within, but this time it was not the cry of a puma. I put down the mouthful that hesitated upon my lips and listened. Silence, save for the whisper of the morning breeze. I began to think my ears had deceived me. After a long pause, I resumed my meal, but with my ears still vigilant. Presently, I heard something else, very faint and low. I sat as if frozen in my attitude. Though it was faint and low, it moved me more profoundly than all that I had hitherto heard of the abomination behind the wall. There was no mistake this time in the quality of the dim, broken sounds, no doubt at all of their source. For it was groaning, broken by sobs and gasps of anguish. It was no brute this time. It was a human being in torment. As I realized this, I rose and in three steps had crossed the room, seized the handle of the door into the yard and flung it open before me. Prendick, man, stop! cried Montgomery, intervening. A startled deer hound yelped and snarled. There was blood, I saw, in the sink, brown and some scarlet, and I smelt the, the peculiar smell of carbolic acid. Then, through an open doorway beyond, in the dim light of the shadow, I saw something bound painfully upon a framework, scarred, red, and bandaged, and then, blotting this out, appeared the face of old Moreau, white and terrible. In a moment, he had gripped me by the shoulder with a hand that was smeared red, had twisted me off my feet, and flung me headlong back into my own room. He lifted me as though I was a little child. I fell at full length upon the floor, and the door slammed and shut out the passionate intensity of his face. Then I heard the key turn in the lock, and Montgomery's voice rise in expostulation. "'Ruin the work of a lifetime,' I heard Moreau say. "'He does not understand,' said Montgomery, and other things that were inaudible. "'I can't spare the time yet,' said Moreau. The rest I did not hear. I picked myself up and stood, trembling, my mind a chaos of the most horrible misgivings. Could it be possible, I thought, that such a thing as the vivisection of men was carried on here?' The question shot like lightning across a tumultuous sky, and suddenly the clouded horror of my mind condensed into a vivid realization of my own danger. Eleven. The Hunting of the Man it came before my mind with an unreasonable hope of escape that the outer door of my room was still open to me. I was convinced now, absolutely assured, that Moreau had been vivisecting a human being. All the time since I had heard his name, I had been trying to link in my mind in some way the grotesque animalism of the islanders with his abominations, and now I thought I saw it all. The memory of his work on the transfusion of blood recurred to me. These creatures I had seen were the victims of some hideous experiment. These sickening scoundrels had merely intended to keep me back, to fool me with their display of confidence, and presently to fall upon me with a fate more horrible than death, with torture and after torture, the most hideous degradation it is possible to conceive, to send me off a lost soul, a beast, to the rest of their commerce route. I looked round for some weapon. Nothing. Then, with an inspiration, I turned over a deck chair, put my foot on the side of it, and tore away the side rail. It happened that a nail came away with the wood, and, projecting, gave a touch of danger to an otherwise petty weapon. I heard a step outside, and incontinently flung open the door and found Montgomery within a yard of it. He meant to lock the outer door. I raised this nailed stick of mine and cut at his face, but he sprang back. I hesitated a moment, then turned and fled round the corner of the house. Prendick, man! I heard his astonished cry. Don't be a silly ass, man! Another minute, thought I, and he would have had me locked in, and as ready as a hospital rabbit for my fate. He emerged behind the corner, for I heard him shout, Prendick! Then he began to run after me, shouting things as he ran. This time running blindly, I went north-eastward in a direction at right angles to my previous expedition. Once, as I went running headlong up the beach, I glanced over my shoulder and saw his attendant with him. 
I ran furiously up the slope, over it, and then turning eastward along a rocky valley fringed on either side with jungle, I ran for perhaps a mile altogether, my chest straining, my heart beating in my ears, and then, hearing nothing of Montgomery or his man, and feeling upon the verge of exhaustion, I doubled sharply back towards the beach, as I judged, and lay down in the shelter of a cane break. There I remained for a long time, too fearful to move, and indeed too fearful even to plan a course of action. The wild scene about me lay sleeping silently under the sun, and only the sounds near me was the thin hum of some small gnats that had discovered me. Presently I became aware of a drowsy breathing sound, the sowing of the sea upon the beach. After about an hour... I heard Montgomery shouting my name far away to the north. That set me thinking of my plan of action. As I interpreted it then, this island was inhabited only by these two vivisectors and their animalized victims. Some of these, no doubt, they could press into their service against me if need arose. I knew both Moreau and Montgomery carried revolvers and, save for a feeble bar of deal spiked with a small nail, the merest mockery of a mace, I was unarmed. So I lay still there until I began to think of food and drink, and at that thought the real hopelessness of my position came home to me. I knew no way of getting anything to eat. I was too ignorant of botany to discover any resort of root or fruit that might lie about me. I had no means of trapping the few rabbits upon the island. I grew blanker the more I turned the prospect over. At last, in the desperation of my position, my mind turned to the animal men I had encountered. I tried to find some hope in what I remembered of them. In turn, I recalled each one I had seen and tried to draw some augury of assistance from my memory. Then, suddenly, I heard a staghound bay, and at that realized a new danger. I took little time to think, or they would have caught me then, but, snatching up my nailed stick, rushed headlong from my hiding place towards the sound of the sea. I remember a growth of thorny plants with spines that stabbed like pen knives. I emerged bleeding and with torn clothes upon the lip of a long creek opening northward. I went straight into the water, without a minute's hesitation, wading up the creek, and presently finding myself knee-deep in a little stream. I scrambled out at last on the westward bank, and with my heart beating loudly in my ears, crept into a tangle of ferns to await the issue. I heard the dog, there was only one, draw nearer, and yelp when it came to the thorns. Then I heard no more, and presently began to think that I had escaped. The minutes passed, the silence lengthened out, and at last, after an hour of security, my courage began to return to me. By this time, I was no longer very much terrified or very miserable. I had, as it were, passed the limit of terror and despair. I felt now that my life was practically lost, and that persuasion made me capable of daring anything. I had even a certain wish to encounter Moreau face to face, and as I had waded into the water, I remembered that if I were too hard-pressed, at least one path of escape from torment still lay open to me. They could not very well prevent me drowning myself. I had half a mind to drown myself then, but an odd wish to see the whole adventure out. A queer, impersonal, spectacular interest in myself restrained me. I stretched my limbs, sore and painful from the pricks of the spiny plants, and stared around me at the trees, and, so suddenly that it seemed to jump out of the green tracery about it, my eyes lit upon a black face watching me. I saw that it was the simian creature who had met the launch upon the beach. He was clinging to an oblique stem of a palm tree. I gripped my stick and stood up facing him. He began chattering, you, 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 was all I could distinguish at first. Suddenly, he dropped from the tree, and in another moment was holding the fronds apart and staring curiously at me. I did not feel the same repugnance towards this creature which I had experienced in my encounters with the other beast men. You, he said, in the boat. He was a man then, at least as much a man as Montgomery's attendant, for he could talk. Yes, I said, I came in the boat from the ship. Oh, 
he said, and his bright, restless eyes travelled over me to my hands, to the stick I carried, to my feet, to the tattered places in my coat, and the cuts and scratches I'd received from the thorns. He seemed puzzled at something. His eyes came back to my hands. He held his own hand out and counted his digits slowly. One, two, three, four, five, eight. I did not grasp his meaning then. Afterwards, I was to find that a great proportion of these beast people had malformed hands, lacking sometimes even three digits. But guessing this was in some way a greeting, I did the same thing by way of reply. He grinned with immense satisfaction. Then his swift roving glance went round again. He made a swift movement and vanished. The fern fronds he had stood between came swishing together. I pulled out of the break after him and was astonished to find him swinging cheerfully by one lank arm from a rope of creepers that looped down from the foliage overhead. His back was to me. Hello, said I. He came down with a twisting jump and stood facing me. Uh, I say, said I, where can I get something to eat? Eat, he said. Eat man's food now. And his eyes went back to the swing of ropes. At the huts. Uh, but where are the huts? Oh, I'm new, you know. At that, he swung round and set off at a quick walk. All his motions were curiously rapid. Come along, said he. I went with him to see the adventure out. I guess the huts were some rough shelter where he and some more of these beast people lived. I might perhaps find them friendly, find some handle in their minds to take hold of. I did not know how far they had forgotten their human heritage. My ape-like companion trotted along by my side, with his hands hanging down and his jaw thrust forward. I wondered what memory he might have in him. "'How long have you been on this island?' said I. "'How long?' he asked, and after having the question repeated, he held up three fingers. This creature was little better than an idiot. I tried to make out what he meant by that, and it seemed I bored him. After another question or two, he suddenly left my side and went leaping at some fruit that hung from a tree. He pulled down a handful of prickly husks and went on eating the contents. I noted this with satisfaction, for here, at least, was a hint for feeding. I tried him with some other questions, but his chattering prompt responses were as often as not quite at cross-purposes with my question. Some few were appropriate, others quite parrot-like. I was so intent upon these peculiarities that I scarcely noticed the path we followed. Presently we came to trees, all charred and brown, and so to a bare place covered with a white, yellow incrustation, across which a drifting smoke, pungent in whiffs to nose and eyes, went drifting. On our right, over a shoulder of bare rock, I saw the level blue of the sea. The path coiled down abruptly into a narrow ravine, between two tumbled and knotty masses of blackish scoriae. Into this we plunged. It was extremely dark, this passage, after the blinding sunlight reflected from the sulphurous grounds. Its walls grew steep and approached one another. Blotches of green and crimson drifted across my eyes. My conductor suddenly stopped. Home, said he, and I stood in a floor of a chasm that was at first absolutely dark to me. I heard some strange noises and thrust my knuckles of my left hand into my eyes. I became aware of a disagreeable odour, like that of a monkey's cage ill-cleaned. Beyond, the rock opened again upon a gradual slope of sunlit greenery, and on either hand the light smote down through narrow ways into the central gloom. 12. The Sayers of the Law then something cold touched my hand. I started violently and saw close to me a dim pinkish thing, looking more like a flayed child than anything else in the world. The creature had exactly the mild but repulsive features of a sloth, the same low forehead and slow gestures. As the first shock of the change of light passed, I saw about me more distinctly. The little sloth-like creature was standing and staring at me. My conductor had vanished. The place was a narrow passage between high walls of lava, a crack in the knotted rock, and on either side interwoven heaps of sea mat, palm fans and reeds leaning against the rock formed rough and impenetrably dark dens. The winding way up the ravine between these was scarcely three yards wide and was disfigured by lumps of decaying fruit pulp and other refuse, which accounted for the disagreeable stench of the place. 
The little pink sloth creature was still blinking at me when my ape-man reappeared at the aperture of the nearest of these dens and beckoned me in. As he did so, a slouching monster wriggled out of one of the places further up this strange street and stood up in featureless silhouette against the bright green beyond, staring at me. I hesitated, having half a mind to bolt the way I had come, and then, determined to go through with the adventure, I gripped my nailed stick about the middle and crawled into the little evil-smelling lean-to after my conductor. It was a semicircular space shaped like uh, the half of a beehive, and against the rocky walls that formed the inner side of it was a pile of variegated fruits, uh, coconuts amongst others. Some rough vessels of lava and wood stood around the floor, and one on a rough stool. There was no fire. In the darkest corner of the hut sat a shapeless mass of darkness that grunted, Hey! as I came in, and my ape-man stood in the dim light of the doorway and held out a split coconut to me as I crawled into the other corner and squatted down. I took it and began gnawing it as serenely as possible, in spite of a certain trepidation and the nearly intolerable closeness of the den. The little pink sloth creature stood in the aperture of the hut, and something else with a drab face and bright eyes came staring over its shoulder. Hey! came out of the lump of mystery opposite. It is a man. It is a man, gabbled my conductor. A man, a man, a five man like me. Shut up, said the voice from the dark, and grunted. I gnawed my coconut amidst an impressive stillness. I peered hard into the blackness, but could distinguish nothing. It is a man, the voice repeated. He comes to live with us? It was a thick voice with something in it, a, a kind of whistling overtone that struck me as peculiar, but the English accent was strangely good. The ape-man looked at me as though he expected something. I perceived the pause was interrogative. Uh, he comes to live with you, I said. It is a man. He must learn the law. I began to distinguish now a deeper blackness in the black, a vague outline of a hunched-up figure. Then I noticed the opening of the place was darkened by two more black heads. My hand tightened on my stick. The thing in the dark repeated in a louder tone, Say the words! I had missed its last remark. Not to go on all fours, that is the law, it repeated in a kind of sing-song. I was puzzled. Say the words! said the ape-man, repeating, and the figures in the doorway echoed this with a threat in the tone of their voice. I realized that I had to repeat this idiotic formula, and then began the insanest ceremony. The voice in the dark began intoning a mad litany line by line, and I and the rest to repeat it. As they did so, they swayed from side to side in the oddest way, and beat their hands upon their knees, and I followed their example. I could have imagined I was already dead and in another world. That dark hut, these grotesque dim figures just flecked here and there by a glimmer of light, and all of them swaying in unison and chanting. Not to go on all fours, that is the law. Are we not men? Not to suck up drink, that is the law. Are we not men? Not to eat fish or flesh, that is the law. Are we not men? Not to claw the bark of trees, that is the law. Are we not men? Not to chase other men, that is the law, are we not men? And so, from the prohibition of these acts of folly, on to the prohibition of what I thought then were the maddest, most impossible, and most indecent things one could well imagine. A kind of rhythmic fervour fell on us all. We gabbled, and we swayed faster and faster, repeating this amazing law. Superficially, the contagion of these brutes was upon me, but deep down within me... The laughter and disgust struggled together. We ran through a long list of prohibitions, and then the chant swung round to a new formula. His is the house of pain. His is the hand that makes. His is the hand that wounds. His is the hand that heals. And so on, for another long series, mostly quite incomprehensible gibberish to me, about him, whoever he might be. I could have fancied it was a dream, but never before have I heard chanting in a dream. His is the lightning flash, we sang. His is the deep salt sea. A horrible fancy came into my head that Moreau 
after animalizing these men, had infected their dwarfed brains with a kind of deification of himself. However, I was too keenly aware of white teeth and strong claws about me to stop my chanting on that account. His are the stars in the sky. At last, the song ended. I saw the ape man's face shining with perspiration, and my eyes being now accustomed to the darkness, I saw more distinctly the figure in the corner from which the voice came. It was the size of a man, but it seemed covered with a dull grey hair, almost like a sky terrier. What was it? What were they all? Imagine yourself surrounded by all the most horrible cripples and maniacs it is possible to conceive, and you may understand a little of my feelings with these grotesque caricatures of humanity around me. He is a five man, a five man, a five man like me, said the ape man. I held out my hands. The grey creature in the corner leant forward. Not to run on all fours, that is the law. Are we not men? he said. He put out a strangely distorted talon and gripped my fingers. The thing was almost like the hoof of a deer produced into claws. I could have yelled with surprise and pain. His face came forward and peered at my nails, came forward into the light of the opening of the hut, and I saw with a quivering disgust that it was like the face of neither man nor beast, but a mere shock of grey hair with three shadowy overarchings to mark the eyes and mouth. He has little nails, said this grisly creature in his hairy beard. It is well. He threw my hand down, and instinctively I gripped my stick. Eat herbs and roots. It is his will, said the ape man. I am the sayer of the law, said the grey figure. Here come all that be new to learn the law. I sit in the darkness and say the law. It is even so, said one of the beasts in the doorway. Evil are the punishments of those who break the law. None escape. None escape, said the beast folk, glancing furtively at one another. None, none, said the ape man. None escape. See, I did a little thing, a wrong thing once. I jabbered, jabbered, stopped talking. None could understand. I am burned, branded in the hand. He is great. He is good. None escape, said the grey creature in the corner. None escape, said the beast people, looking askance at one another. For every one the want that is bad, said the grey sayer of the law. What you will want we do not know. We shall know. Some want to follow things that move, to watch and slink and wait and spring, to kill and bite, bite deep and rich, sucking the blood. It is bad. Not to chase other men, that is the law. Are we not men? Not to eat flesh or fish, that is the law. Are we not men? None escape, said a dappled brute standing in the doorway. For every one the want is bad, said the grey sayer of the law. Some want to go tearing with teeth and hands into the roots of things, snuffling into the earth. It is bad. None escape, said the man in the door. Some go clawing trees, some go scratching at the graves of the dead, some go fighting with foreheads or feet or claws, some bite, suddenly none giving occasion, some love uncleanness. "'None escape,' said the ape-man, scratching his calf. "'None escape,' said the little pink sloth creature. "'Punishment is sharp and sure. Therefore learn the law. Say the words.' And incontinently he began again the strange litany of the law, and again I and all these creatures began singing and swaying. My head reeled with this jabbering and the close stench of the place, but I kept on, trusting to find presently some chance of a new development. Not to go on all fours, that is the law. Are we not men? We were making such a noise that I noticed nothing of a tumult outside, until someone, who I think was one of the two swine men I had seen, thrust his head over the little pink sloth creature and shouted something excitedly, something I did not catch. Incontinently, those at the opening of the hut vanished. My ape-man rushed out. The thing that had sat in the dark followed him. I only observed that it was big and clumsy and covered with silver hair. And I was left alone. Then, before I reached the aperture, I heard the yelp of a stag-hound. In another moment, I was standing outside the hovel, my chair rail in my hand, every muscle of me quivering. Before me were the clumsy backs of perhaps a score of these beast people, their misshapen heads half hidden by their shoulder blades. 
They were gesticulating excitedly. Other half-animal faces glared interrogation out of the hovels. Looking in the direction in which they faced, I saw, coming through the haze under the trees beyond the end of the passage of dens, the dark figure and awful white face of Moreau. He was holding the leaping staghound back, and close behind him came Montgomery, revolver in hand. For a moment I stood horror-struck. I turned and saw the passage behind me blocked by another heavy brute, with a huge grey face and twinkling little eyes advancing towards me. I looked round and saw to the right of me, and a half a dozen yards in front of me, a narrow gap in the wall of rock, through which a ray of light slanted in the shadows. "'Stop!' cried Moreau as I strode towards this, and then, "'Hold him!' At that, first one face turned towards me, and then others. Their bestial minds were happily slow. I dashed my shoulder into a clumsy monster who was turning to see what Moreau meant, and flung him forward into another. I felt his hands fly around, clutching at me and missing me. The little pink sloth creature dashed at me, and I gashed down its ugly face with the nail in my stick, and in another minute was scrambling up the steep side pathway, a kind of sloping chimney out of the ravine. I heard a howl behind me and cries of, "'Catch him! Hold him!' and the grey-faced creature appeared behind me and jammed his huge bulk into the cleft. "'Go on! Go on!' they howled. I clambered up the narrow cleft in the rock and came out upon the sulphur on the western side of the village of the Beastmen. That gap was altogether fortunate for me, for the narrow chimney, slanting obliquely upward, must have impeded the nearer pursuers. I ran over the white space and down the steep slope through a scattered growth of trees, and came to a low-lying stretch of tall reeds, through which I pushed into a dark, thick undergrowth that was black and succulent underfoot. As I plunged into the reeds, my foremost pursuers emerged from the gap. I broke my way through this undergrowth for some minutes. The air behind me and about me was soon full of threatening cries. I heard the tumult of my pursuers in the gap up the slope, and then the crashing of the reeds, and every now and then the cracking crash of a branch. Some of the creatures roared like excited beasts of prey. The staghound yelped to the left. I heard Moreau and Montgomery shouting in the same direction. I turned sharply to the right. It seemed to me, even then, that I heard Montgomery shouting for me to run for my life. Presently, the ground gave rich and oozy under my feet, but I was desperate and went headlong into it, struggled through, knee-deep, and so came to a winding path amongst tall canes. The noise of my pursuers passed away to my left. In one place, three strange pink hopping animals, about the size of cats, bolted before my footsteps. This pathway ran uphill across another open space covered with white incrustation and plunged into a cane break again. Then suddenly it turned parallel with the edge of a steep-walled gap which came without warning like the ha-ha of an English park, turned with an unexpected abruptness. I was still running with all my might, and I never saw this drop until I was flying headlong through the air. I fell on my forearms and head among thorns and rose with a torn ear and bleeding face. I had fallen into a precipitous ravine, rocky and thorny, full of a hazy mist which drifted about me in wisps, and with a narrow streamlet from which this mist came meandering down through the center. I was astonished at this thin fog in the full blaze of daylight, but I had no time to stand wondering then. I turned to my right downstream, hoping to come to the sea in that direction, and so have my way open to drown myself. It was only later I found that I had dropped my nailed stick in my fall. Presently, the ravine grew narrower for a space, and carelessly I stepped into the stream. I jumped out again pretty quickly, for the water was almost boiling. I noticed, too, there was a thin sulphurous scum drifting upon its coiling water. Almost immediately came a turn in the ravine and the indistinct blue horizon. The nearer sea was flashing the sun from a myriad facets. I saw my death before me, but I was hot and panting with the warm blood oozing out of my face and running pleasantly through my veins. I felt more than a touch of exultation, too, at having distanced my pursuers. It was not in me then to go out and drown myself yet. I stared back the way I had come. I listened. 
Save for the hum of the gnats and the chirp of some small insects that hopped among the thorns, the air was absolutely still. Then came the yelp of a dog, very faint, and a chattering and gibbering, the snap of a whip, and voices. They grew louder, then fainter again. The noise receded up the stream and faded away. For a while, the chase was over. But I knew now how much hope of help for me lay in the beast people.